Hello and welcome to our service of worship this morning in St Columbus, Lisburn. A couple of pieces of information which you may have picked up but I thought I should say to anyone who's watching this. Firstly that um, at the time of this recording uh, we've just learned that lockdown will continue beyond the beginning of March so I am anticipate being here talking to the benches but talking to you uh, belatedly uh, for another few weeks maybe let's best guess at Easter. So notwithstanding, sorry for the lack of direct contact, but it's beyond our, our uh, decision just now. One other piece of information came to me uh, at the end of the week, and it was that um, a church in the town had been contacted, various members had been contacted, asking them to, to buy online vouchers and forward the details on to someone else using the name of the minister. It's uh, one of these scams that are very common these days, but apparently a new thing uh, for churches to be contacted by somebody, supposedly their minister, asking them to buy credit notes or goods online to forward to someone else uh, and a sob story attached to it. Just to say that if there's something to be dealt with, we'll deal with you directly and you'll know who's contacting you and you'll know how it's going. So we wouldn't use anonymous uh, third party or, or tax just to, to speak to you. Just don't do it. Let's look then at our service this morning and we'll continue our studies uh, in Mark's Gospel or in chapter 2 this morning but as we begin let's, let's pray together. God our Heavenly Father, you are most generous with your grace. Your grace, you are most intimate in care and we come to you along familiar ways and even if we're behind a screen rather than behind a pew. We approach you with songs that we know, readings and prayers. Lord, take us from the comfort and ease maybe of our own living room and a cup of tea in our hands to stab us awake to what we're doing. To not allow a familiarity with a format or a comfort. To, to breed a nonchalance and, dare we say, an indifference. We want to be surprised this morning, surprised with the miracle so that we relive it again and so make room in our minds and our hearts for a renewed wonder and adoration of Jesus Christ, your Son. Lord, interrupt our ways, intrude into our comfort and break us free so that we may be free indeed. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we've been relying on Andrew McCartney, the student from Belfast Bible College, who's going to edit this to procure us some music. So I may introduce somebody I don't know singing something I don't know, but I'm sure it's good. So over to Andrew and friends for our first piece of music. Still with me, 
my sin had left a crimson stain. He washed you white as so. My sin had left a crimson stain. He found in Mark chapter 2 and we read the first 12 verses. A few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered there that there was no room left even outside the door and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to them a paralytic carried by four of them and since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd. They made a, an opening in the roof above Jesus and after digging through it they lowered the mat the paralyzed man was on. When Jesus saw his their faith he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? What is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and take your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amused everyone and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Amen. Now let's look at that exciting and dramatic uh, account of Jesus' miracles and his intrusion into their world, even as four friends intruded into uh, the comfort of a domestic scene. Maybe <clears throat> to begin with, have you heard these, uh, this song on the radio? It's been played now almost incessantly and if you're like me, you listen to Radio 105, other stations are available on the radio, there'll hardly be a day go past, but and get friends that will run through walls. It's a song by the script, you're a Dublin band, and uh, it's a gentle melodic thing, and it's a really a persuasive story to say of a person who feels sometimes down, sometimes dismissed, but they've got friends that look after them. Friends who will run through walls, who will go the extra mile, who will do the extra simply to protect them and see as to his well-being. Now when we turn to the scripture, we find that there are friends here, and indeed there are four of them. Four of them, we assume, and they come to a crowded house where Jesus is there, and they, they find that they cannot enter the house because there's a crowd, and instead, 
instead of running through walls, they take the roof off. On a domestic scene, as the introduction is made here in chapter uh, 2, verse 1, Jesus returns again to Capernaum and he had come home. Now the expression implies that this was probably the same house as earlier in chapter 1 where Simon Peter and his mother-in-law was at home. She was ill with a fever. Jesus came, healed her and she, they, the disciples stayed on. So this is Simon Peter's home. And I just thought as an aside, in a domestic circumstance, that woman's been through a lot. She's catering for a, cal- a gathering of disciples. Now they've crowded the room and they're the religious leaders sitting in the front room with the fine china. And, and it's all going well until the roof comes off. Well, just when you thought you'd got the, <laughs> the new curtains on and the decoration and the wallpaper sorted, somebody comes through the roof. Sometimes our idea of what seems a good idea or what's appropriate it gets thrown in the side. But the strange thing is, Jesus seems happy with this. Jesus is impressed by the friends. Such was their loyalty towards the fifth mat, the, the one on the mat, that they thought, if we want to get him to Jesus, that's it, job done, because something surely good will happen after that. So Jesus, as much as there's dust and plaster and bits and pieces falling down in the room, and he's, as he's there talking, that's what he came for, is to see faith and see people motivated, activated, and, and they will not let go until they have a blessing. He's impressed with the faith, but also he speaks to the man on the mat. Why is that important? Well, if Jesus is here to give dignity, liberty, and rescue to people, it's important that the man on the mat, paralyzed as he is, and he doesn't have a word to say in the conversation, he doesn't ask for forgiveness, leaping ahead, but all he's told is, son, your sins are forgiven you. He speaks, and before we go any further, speaking directly to someone who is disabled is empowering. You'll see behind me there's a reference made to a radio for broadcast and it had the provocative, um, tightly, uh, tightly thought out title of Does He Take Sugar? Does He Take Sugar? One imagines a scene where there are three people in the room, someone disabled, the carer and the person, the social worker or someone else, and they're trying to be kind and they ask, does he, you know, the one over there, does he take sugar? Like he couldn't answer for himself. I'm trying to be kind, but you know, he's not like us two able-bodied people. Does he take sugar? Jesus looks straight at the man and tells him, suddenly you're back in the game. Not only are you called son, a relational thing, but you're brought in to the freedom and liberty of a son of God. That's a lot more than just having sugar in your tea. Jesus pronounces forgiveness. And he uses a word which says, your sins are let go. They're sent away. They're liberated. It's the same word, afiyemi, as letting it go, dropping a thing, and opening your hand, and it's released. Now, this word is used, it has several meanings in the New Testament, and some of them, uh, are about letting go of debts, your forgiveness. That, you know, he strikes out the debt, they're let go, the afiyemi. They're also used as a man who lets go of his wife, he, he divorces her, or even in this case, sin is written off, it's sent away. And that sense of dismissal, you're on your way, you're out. And so Jesus says to him, your sins have been loosed, let go, released. There's no longer a debt to pay. You're no longer beholden to them or the consequences. It's free. It's forgiven. Now, these are words that are not particularly related to the the reason why the man came, at least to the onlooker. The onlooker saw a man carried in who could not move for himself and doesn't speak for himself. 
But instead, Jesus steps through so many other obstacles into his heart and his history and says, you know that thing that you did? That burden that's been, that's bending you down, that's crippled you, it's gone. You're free of it. When Jesus intrudes in a life, he forgives and forgives fully. He releases the man from his burden and then his legs are released as a proof of it. This statement has a chilling effect in the room. As much as people are crowded, there's a hush and there's a silence. But there are also looks across the room as people are, what's going on here? And no one says a word, but Jesus continues on to say, why do you dialogue in your hearts? I can see what you're thinking. And that expression to dialogue in your heart is literally the word for word translation of what goes on here. You're thinking, how dare you? Who does he think he is? This Jesus. Who does he think he is that he can speak with authority or take authority to himself to say what God really thinks? Because when we sin, we owe it to God. We may hurt and harm other people, but it's only God can forgive. So who is Jesus who he says, he calls himself the Son of Man? The Son of Man has authority to release sins. Because God only can release sins. So this sets up a dilemma in them, and it's they're dialoguing in their hearts, not necessarily in their heads. So it's an emotional thing of they are shocked and horrified more than they are intellectually trying to figure it out. They're scandalized by this, that this person who seemed as ordinary as them as another more celebrity in the way up in the local village of Capernaum can suddenly take the place of God and start forgiving sins. The miracle that follows then only gives credibility to the internal and the unseen. The invisible healing takes first and then Jesus says, well, what's easier? Whether I say the words to let go of his sin or to let go of his illness and let the man go. He says, your sins are forgiven. It's a passive. It's done. It's, it's sorted. It's, it's a deal that's been organized and you didn't do anything with it. It's a passive voice. They're done. What's easier either to say, that's finished. That's over. Or get up. Rise. Matt, go. Three directive words, three instructions that tells the man, get up, lift your mat and go. That he's sent, even as sin, sins are dismissed and sent away, so too is he. Released on new fine legs to go and do and live in a better, more grateful way. Jesus uses this as an illustration, as a, like a, a craft a craft person, here's one I prepared earlier. Here he does a demonstration model of, here's what I can do on the inside, and so as that works, here he is up and walking away. But that you might know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus uses this term, Son of Man, to refer to himself as one like us. Yes, he's a man, but also that reference in Daniel chapter 7 where there's a, a, a one who appears as a son of man and yet he's a heavenly person yet he's a, a up to that point in Daniel they weren't sure how to classify him but Jesus here sees himself as God incarnate the one who walks across this globe but looks like us and he's here and he brings all the authority of heaven himself heaven itself to him here and now so let's work to say some conclusions here. Some conclusions are that simply we need friends. There are times when you and I can look back and think we were so crippled and curled up in a ball emotionally, physically or otherwise, perhaps sickness or other, and we needed somebody to go fetch, lift, tell us the things we needed to do and even in the vulnerability of our own guilt and shame to tell us who we are, to wipe up and clean up after us and say no more about it. 
We need friends to bring us to Jesus. All of us here had someone in their lives that came in at a point and said, do you know I've met Jesus Christ? You should come to. You come to a meeting, you meet in a prayer room. Very few of us, very few, came to faith on their own without the active witness of another. So we need friends to carry us through life and we need friends to carry us to Jesus. That's one simple, obvious lesson here. One also could be seen here is, did the disciples get in the way? I imagine that Simon Peter might have been a bit precious about his house and I made that sort of light-hearted remark about the mother-in-law at the start, but we imagine this house, a domestic one, reasonably sized, perhaps maybe bigger than others, but that there, the doorway is choked up and the way they have, the way they run the house, it means that others don't get through. Maybe as churches we need to look at what obstacles we have or whether we're too much in the walls and behind the walls. And maybe even this pandemic has been an occasion where we've been forced and compelled to go out and go beyond. Even if we're domestically situated, we're compelled to, to look beyond the structures and the format of usual Sunday and that's us done. I hope that staying at home has been an opportunity to go. Grow and go more than it's been one to curl up and be content. Another conclusion in this is sin and unforgiveness and a bitterness can cripple people one way or another as it grows and festers within. The psalmist says, when I kept quiet, your word burned inside me. And there's something that needs to be released and let go of and sorted and flattened and leveled. And so it is that I'm sure you can find examples as I can even in a pastoral life where some folk have, have carried a burden and a, a guilty secret such that it put them into a mental hospital for years. Because the ones they needed to confess it to, they thought they couldn't, they couldn't let go of it. It would harm their relationship, but instead they swallowed the pain and choked back and hurt on it. Jesus says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And he does that to heal us for a more fit, purposeful life than the one we'd be left to otherwise. If you have something to say, say it to a person you can trust, say it in your prayers, say it truly in your heart, and accept the forgiveness that Jesus offers. And fourthly, finally, Jesus has authority. Jesus claims this ultimate authority that he can settle relationships, ultimate eternal relationships between people like us and God the Heavenly Father, the maker and creator of this world. He says he can do that. Surely he's worthy of our respect or following or obedience. Amen. Let's take a, um, some time now in prayer and then We'll uh, pause for, for more music and finally then with a benediction. Let's pray. God our Heavenly Father, we, we wonder sometimes how often we cripple others and even enslave ourselves with this unforgiveness. Where we hold standards that we think are right, but Jesus welcomes them more than we do. Jesus is prepared for some material loss and fixing up in the afternoon simply to fix a soul. Lord, we wonder what liberty we've sacrificed on the altar of hoarded grudges or infected hurts. Oh, what peace and joy we have denied ourselves simply because you do not take things to God in prayer. What a friend we have in Jesus. Lord, Jesus' intrusion into this world means the payback mentality of I want them to pay it back every penny. No longer belongs to the demands of a servant who's been forgiven lots. But Lord, freely we have been forgiven freely. Freely we have received, freely we give. We hold up to you those among our family, our friends, our work colleagues who are going through miserable times. Those who are crippled, 
or struggle with illness, who are at home or who are undergoing treatment or in hospital. Lord, those in nursing homes, please help them. Please help those who attend them. We think of the four friends that carry this man on the, on the corners of a mat and they bring him. Lord, sustain them too. And may they find that joy, that euphoria. I can imagine the, the cries and the whoop whoop joy as people looked in through the hole in the roof to see their friend walk up and walk through the doorway. Suddenly there was space to walk out where there wasn't space to walk in. Lord, may your love undergird all who need your help today. May your light lead them and your mercy shield them and your grace liberate and transform them. You give liberty and power to your son and he forgives the sins of your children. May his authority come upon your people today that we can be set free from the past, enjoy the freedom and hope for the future. Lord, with this freedom of Christ running loose in us, set us then free in that ministry of forgiving others, to raising them up on their feet and sending them on their way. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. I now hand you across to the musicians who will lead us in a second piece of music. Pray. 
speak this word of benediction and just as a note that picture I took outside when it was minus four the night before and yet this little flower in our garden at the back of the church does its best to show its bloom it's a stubborn little flower and may you pee may we both be stubborn in the face of a cold world to show the beauty that we've been given so assured then of that forgiveness found in Jesus let no critic undermine your peace. No thoughtless friend put you down and no enemy project shame upon you. May indeed the word of God speak through you, the love of Christ flow through you and the joy of the Spirit sing in you. Thanks be to God.